Welcome everyone to our Mary Greeley Primetime Alive presentation, Your Eyes As You Age. I am Vicki Newell and I am the manager of the Primetime Alive program. As a reminder, if you would like more information about Primetime Alive or how to join, please visit our website, mgmc.org PTA. Our presenter today is Dr. Joy Carroll. Dr. Carroll received her bachelor's degree in genetics from Iowa State University and her medical degree from the University of Iowa. She completed an internship in general surgery and a residency in ophthalmology at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Carroll joined McFarland Clinic Ophthalmology in August 2018. Please welcome Dr. Joy Carroll. All right, well, thank you very much for that um, introduction. I'm excited to discuss today um, your eyes as you age. I have no disclosures. So these are the topics that we'll be discussing today. And I tried to hit topics that are most common or maybe that most people have heard of. And so the first thing we'll be discussing is presbyopia. In order to enjoy this discussion, we do need to hit a little bit of anatomy of the eye. And so I've included a, a picture here. And the area that we'll need to um, be focusing on for presbyopia is the lens, which you can see is in the front half of the eye or the anterior segment. As a review for people, um, the cornea is the clear covering on the front of the eye. That's what hurts if it gets scratched. Behind that is the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. The pupil looks black, and that's just the empty space in the middle of the iris. The focus is light back through the lens. The lens is held into place by zonules to the ciliary body. The back half of the eye is filled with a clear jelly called vitreous. And then the retina is where the photoreceptors are, which is where the biochemical reactions that help us to see occur which is supplied by blood vessels, and that information then travels through the optic nerve back to the brain. The white part of the eye um, is called the sclera, and there's a little covering on top of the sclera called the conjunctiva. So presbyopia is Greek for old age. Presbyopia is a change in accommodation that makes it hard to read. This usually begins around age 40, but people who are farsighted naturally may actually notice difficulty reading in their late 30s, and people who are nearsighted naturally may not notice problems until they're closer to 50. So in order to accommodate, that means change the shape of the lens inside the eye to move the focal point closer. The lens right here, like I said, is attached by zonules um, to the ciliary body. And when we want to see up close, we're very good at this as children, we can change the shape of the lens to make it more spherical. Now, as we have more birthdays, our ability to do this decreases. This is thought to be because the lens becomes a little bit more um, hard or dense and difficult to change shapes, possibly with an early cataract. There's also a theory that uh, the musculature controlling this may start to wear out a little bit as well. There are a couple of mainstay treatments for presbyopia. The first is natural. It's holding reading material farther away. And so many people notice their arms are just no longer long enough. And that is a sign of presbyopia. Reading glasses are the next treatment that most people will try. And they come in many varieties. These are some examples of different types of lenses um, that you can have made into your normal glasses. Of course, if you don't need glasses for distance vision, then you could just use your reading glasses, and that could be over the counter, or preferably one that we can find using our foropter, which is this machine here on this last slide in our clinic. So there are bifocals, which is this top picture A, and that very clearly has an area to look out at the distance for distance viewing. And then the bottom half of that lens is for near viewing. 
There are a lot of different styles of bifocals, and the bifocal that's best for you will depend on the type of prescription you have for your distance glasses. And that's because as we look from the top part of the bifocal to the bottom part of the bifocal, we'll see magnification of the image, but that image can also move a little bit. And so below the A, there's C and D, and these types of bifocals will be helpful for more helpful for people who are either far-sighted or near-sighted. On the right-hand column, there's a trifocal, and that has a clear delineation in the center, and that represents where intermediate vision will be best. Below that are a couple more examples of where a trifocal could fit. The bottom pictures here show with dotted lines what a progressive lens might look like. Progressive lenses are sometimes called no-line bifocals, and they're kind of sneaky because they allow you to have a young appearance as if you don't need reading glasses or bifocals, but still help you to see clearly for reading. And you can see there's different um, styles of no-line bifocals or progressive lenses. I'll point out that there is a transition zone if you look at the bottom right, which is letter H, um, and you can see these little numbers here. Number four represents where the vision just isn't very clear. It can be distorted. Number one is distance vision, two is intermediate, and three is near vision. And so it does take a little bit of getting used to to use a progressive lens um, because it's not immediately obvious where you should be looking through the glasses at different distances. And a lot of people tell me that they need to tilt their head a little bit to see clearly at the intermediate distance on their computer. Another option is to just correct one eye for near vision and keep another eye for distance vision. This is called monovision, and it works with contact lenses and also with intraocular lenses. Multifocal lenses in forms of the contact lens or an intraocular lens are another option. This is a representation of what a multifocal lens might look like with the near vision area being represented by blue and then a gradation to intermediate vision and distance vision around the outside. Now coming soon, there is an eye drop which is under clinical trials right now. Um, and so if you are not yet 40 or don't have significant presbyopia, that could be an option depending on how soon that gets approved. Um, and these eye drops work in a couple of different ways. One of them helps by making the pupil smaller to reduce diffraction of light. Um, and the other can actually soften the lens. Now, it does have to be used several times throughout the day, um, but that's what's in the pop pipeline in research. So we discussed presbyopia, which is probably one of the most common complaints that my patients have, especially around the ages of 40 to 50. And next we'll discuss cataract. All right, so there are a lot of different types of cataract, and this is just a striking example of a white cataract. Cataracts cause blurred vision they can cause the color of the vision to change to be more dull or yellow in color. They can cause distortion or glare. Sometimes they can cause double vision out of just one eye. And we'll see if this link works. So this is a simulator and it's on the American Academy of Ophthalmology website, which is where many of these pictures um, came from. This is the picture on the slide, and you can see that it's getting progressively more blurred. I like this picture because it shows um, Christmas lights, and I think Christmas lights are a classic example um, to demonstrate when the vision is slightly blurry due to refractive error. And I actually used this as my own example before I got glasses. Christmas lights had this glow about them. Um, and once my refractive error was corrected, I could see the filament inside the light and it was less magical. <laughs> but you can see there's kind of a sweet spot here um, until the cataract gets really bad. So we'll go back to the presentation now and on to our next slide. So cataracts most commonly present after the age of 60, but they can actually present at any age and occasionally we'll have 
babies born with cataracts or develop cataracts shortly after birth. But in most of my patients, around the age of 60 is when I start to notice some cataract. Um, having people in your family who developed cataract early is a risk factor for you also developing your cataract earlier than usual. Smoking can also increase the speed of cataract development. Injury can cause a cataract, which is what this larger picture shows is a traumatic cataract. You can see that kind of pretty sunflower petal, um, but it's probably hard to see through, and so this patient I'm sure will be happy to have their cataract removed. Steroid use can increase cataract formation, as can diabetes or ultraviolet radiation. The picture at the bottom here is a cerulean cataract, and that is a type of cataract that is usually genetic and sometimes doesn't actually affect vision very often. This slide shows um, the pathology of a cataract over a normal lifespan. And so the top picture here, A, is a lens from a six-month-old. B is an eight-year-old. C is a 12-year-old. So you can see that the lens is very clear and easy to see through at that time. We start to get a little bit of a tan appearance in our 20s. And then E here is in someone who's 47 years old and F is 60 years old. And so this is when I start to mention cataract usually to my patients because I think it probably is at least changing colors a little bit. You can see that this continues to progress, G, H, and I here. At the bottom are some kind of extreme examples. This is a dense nuclear cataract. Um, K is also nuclear but somewhat cortical. And then L here is a cortical cataract. So these are the different types of um, cataracts, if they were never treated, that we might see at the end of life. So what is treatment for cataracts? Well, the first treatment is a change in a glasses prescription. For many people, cataract will cause a myopic shift, which causes a second sight, meaning they no longer need their reading glasses um, if they used to be farsighted because they become a little bit more nearsighted due to the change in the lens um, thickness. Uh, but eventually that usually gives way to the overall vision becoming more blurred and vision no longer being correctable with glasses alone. At that point, we recommend cataract surgery. And we're living in a great time for this, um, but cataracts have been a problem since human existence, and so um, surgical techniques have improved a lot over the years. These pictures show a few different ways that we can approach surgery. At the bottom right here, this is a picture of phacoemulsification, which is how cataracts are addressed um, currently. The bottom left shows an extracapsular cataract extraction, and you can see that a large incision was made um, mostly, most of the width there of the cornea. Um, and then the cataract is actually being expelled by applying pressure to the outside of the eye on the opposite side of the eye, and it's being guided by an instrument through the incision. As you can imagine, that would cause um, a little bit more difficulty with healing as well as um, an increase in astigmatism. So, the first recorded cataract surgery was actually in around 800 BC and occurred in India. And that was similar to this picture here um, of the extracapsular cataract where a scleral tunnel was made. Um, but then instead of guiding um, the cataract out with instruments, the patient was just asked to sneeze or blow their nose and expelled the cataract in that way. Sometimes this has been recorded as couching, but couching is separate is actually different. Now, couching still occurs sometimes in remote areas of the world um, and is an unsafe practice. But mostly we think of it as being the 18th and 19th century in the Roman era as well. And couching consists of knocking the lens out of place back into the back half of the eye into the vitreous. And that's what this picture is demonstrating is how to perform couching. Now, the people who performed couching were um, traveling, and so they would perform their couching and then move on to the next village. Um, and that's important because they would be out of a job if they stayed around too long. 
because people who receive couching as cataract treatment will initially have brighter colors and more clear vision because the cataract is no longer blocking their vision, but they'll develop an inflammatory reaction to the retained lens material within a few weeks of the couching and can actually go ahead and lose the remaining vision at that time. And so that's why it only works with traveling people um, and obviously not something we recommend now. Now, with the improvement in technique to remove cataracts, um, there was a problem with refractive error following the removal of the lens. And that's because the lens and the cornea work together in order to bend light to focus it on the back of the eye. About one third of the refracting power of light occurs at the lens. And so if that's removed and not replaced, the glasses must be very large to correct for that. And you may remember your own parents or grandparents having cataract surgery um, before the 1950s or so and having what I call Coke bottle glasses afterwards. And that's because they had such a large refractive error once the lens was removed. And so during World War II, some of the pilots unfortunately had their windshields broken while flying and sometimes that material got into the eye. And there was an observation at that time that the material, polymethylmethacrylate, didn't cause an inflammatory reaction in the eye. And so an ophthalmologist decided to try to make an intraocular lens to replace a cataract that was removed using that same, same material, which is known as PMMA for short. And to some extent it worked because it didn't cause an inflammatory reaction. But at the same time, it took a plus 20 refractive error and made it a minus 20 refractive error because he forgot to take into account the differences in the refractive indices of the material that light is moving through. Um, but once that was corrected, uh, he came a lot closer to the goal. And so for many years, everyone was given a lens that had the same amount of correction for refraction, and then there would still be a large need for glasses after cataract surgery. But we've now fine-tuned that, and there are a lot of different calculations that are performed, and I normally compare multiple different calculations prior to inserting a lens for cataract surgery, and they use methods such as statistical re regression and ray tracing um, to determine what how much refractive error there will be in an eye so that about that much can be corrected with the intraocular lens that's implanted. And this is a picture of an intraocular lens that can be implanted at the time of surgery here. This is a classic three-piece intraocular lens. Um, and this would help make vision clear at just one distance. There are some other options to help correct certain types of astigmatism. And there are multifocal intraocular lenses, as I briefly touched upon for the presbyopia problem as well. And in certain patients, those can be very helpful to reduce the overall need for glasses after surgery, although they do come with their own set of drawbacks. All right, so that was cataract surgery. And Next, we'll move on to dry eye. Dry eye is extremely common. It affects about 20% of the population. It causes symptoms such as burning, stinging, redness, sometimes itching, sensitivity to light, known as photophobia, and blurry vision. And this is a picture of someone who has a dry, uncomfortable eye, um, and they've actually developed a little bit of inflammation here. And so this might qualify as episcleritis, um, which is most frequently caused by dry eye. So who gets dry eye? Well, anyone can get dry eye, but it's more common with advancing age. It's more common in women. Some medicines that we take make dry eye worse, such as antihistamines. That's what you would use for allergies or estrogen replacements. A history of eye surgery, radiation, or a stem, a stem cell transplantation can all increase the risk of dry eye. Vitamin A deficiency is a major cause of dry eye in the developing world, especially, and can lead to blinding disease in children with measles. Thyroid disease sometimes presents the ophthalmologist as dry eye. 
And then other systemic diseases such as Sjogren's disease and rheumatoid arthritis are associated with dry eye. This is a picture of what we might see with someone who has dry eye um, staining with a fluorescein eye drop. You can see all these little dots here on the cornea and that looks very uncomfortable. And as you imagine, we'll also blur vision because the light entering the eye does not have a clear path to the back. So what treatments do we have for dry eye? The first treatments I recommend are environmental changes. Dry eye can be worse in the winter because it's so dry in the air. And I recommend that patients avoid fans, especially an overhead fan while sleeping. They can use a dehumidifier, um, but that's not going to help the dry eye. And so I'd recommend that if they're able to humidify the air, that could be more helpful. And also just avoiding smoke or stopping smoking in patients who do smoke. The computer is another culprit, and so trying to reduce screen time may help. And then also standing above the computer and looking down at the computer reduces the amount of the eye that's exposed to air for an extended period of time, and so that can reduce some symptoms. I also recommend taking breaks and making sure that we're thinking about blinking, because we tend to not blink enough when we're engrossed, whether that's on a computer or reading, doing something like that. Um, reduced tear formation is a major cause of dry eye. And so I'll refer to this picture here. Um, this is a lacrimal gland. It's located under the eyelid um, in the temporal orbit here. Um, and that secretes many of our tears, which then wash across the ocular surface and ultimately drain into our nose. That's why you can get a stuffy nose after you've been crying. And they drain through these canaliculi, the canaliculi. Here's one on the bottom and here's one on the top. The little opening from the canaliculus um, to the eye is called the puncta. Those join in a common canaliculus and then drain into the lacrimal sac, which from there drains to the nose. So for reduced tear formation, I recommend using artificial tears four times daily. And those are available over the counter, and there are a lot of good brands. I don't like it when my patients use any brands that say they will get the red out of the eye, because that can be counterproductive. That causes vasoconstriction of blood vessels, and after using it for a few days, it can cause what's called rebound hyperemia, meaning the eye will look even more red than if the eye drop had never been used. So that's my one warning with over-the-counter artificial tears. In some cases, this isn't enough, and steroids or medicines like a topical cyclosporine may be prescribed by your ophthalmologist, and those help increase the amount of tears that are produced. Another option is to keep the tears around longer that we're already producing. And we can do that with punctal plugs, and they are placed in the clinic right into the puncta of the inferior and or superior puncta. And so there are several different ways that we can re treat the reduction in that tear film formation. Sometimes dry eye is in part due to inflammation of the eyelid. Um, we have oil glands that align our eyelids called mybobian glands, and they secrete oil, and the oil mixes with the aqueous portion of the tears and a mucus portion of the tears, and the oil helps keep the tears from evaporating too quickly. In fact, in people who have very oily tears, we can see the tears evaporating during the eye exam. And so treatment for that type of dry eye consists of treating the oil glands by using a warm compress, such as a hot washcloth on the eyelids for five minutes twice a day, and then giving the eyelashes a little scrub with either a baby shampoo or a commercially made eyelid cleaning pad, and that helps get debris and extra oil off the edge of the eyelids. Fish oil supplementation is another option, and this helps increase the amount of omega-3 fatty acids, which tend to move through those oil glands a little bit more easily. Um, and then I also recommend treating any underlying rosacea, which is what this patient has. Um, and that's sometimes done with an oral medication such as doxycycline. 
I'm gonna go back one more time here. So this is blepharitis in this bottom right picture. And so you can see redness along the edge of the eyelid and that's inflammation of the oil glands. And then we can also see um, some debris here at the edge of the eyelashes. And this is usually not visible unless we're using magnification as in this picture. And that's the reason for doing the scrub with the baby shampoo after doing the warm compress. Now, some people have such severe dry eye disease that it can be vision threatening and they don't always respond to the treatments that we've already discussed. And so I would call this a more end stage dry eye. And I have several additional treatments available for these patients. And the bottom left here shows a scleral contact lens. And this is different from a soft contact lens or a hard contact lens with which you might be familiar because it actually touches the eye on the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, and then vaults over the cornea. You can see in this picture, the patient has an irregular shape to the cornea. And then between the lens and the cornea um, is saline, which is put in the contact before the contact is put in place. And this creates this liquid reservoir, and it does two things. It keeps the eye comfortable by bathing it constantly in saline, and it also improves the ability to bend light. And that is because now, instead of using an irregular surface as the surface with the tear film, which is where the light bends initially as it enters the eye, we have this very regular surface of the scleral contact lens. Now, a disadvantage to a scleral contact lens is it can be difficult to get used to, it can be a little bit awkward to put in, and of course, it does come with a cost. A tarsorophy is a permanent closure of the eyelids, and that's what is shown in the middle picture here. And I most commonly use this on patients who have a neurotro neurotrophic component to their dry eye, which might be caused by having had shingles in the eye or trauma to the, um, trauma to the eye. We also can see this if the eyelids um, are paralyzed. And so obviously it's not a first line treatment for patients because the vision is somewhat obscured by the eyelids. But at the same time, it does allow the eye to sometimes be maintained and some vision to be maintained. Another option, which is in the bottom right here, is an amniotic membrane graft. And that is exactly what it sounds like. Um, Amniotic membranes are harvested after birth, and they have plenty of growth factors that actually help with healing. And so this one is in a contact lens format and can be placed in the clinic. And most commonly, I'll use these in patients who have suffered severe chemical trauma or otherwise have a neurotrophic cause for their inability to heal either very bad dry eye or a corneal abrasion. Um, as you can imagine, it does blur the vision and that ring from the contact lens, uh, you can feel under the eyelid. And so it's not a long-term solution, but it can definitely help with healing or getting through a tough time. The other thing that I don't have a picture of is autologous serum tears. And those are tears that are made from a patient's own blood serum. And so when I prescribe this, a patient will go to a lab have blood drawn, that blood is then spun down and the serum is separated and processed into bottles. And these are their own tears. This can also be expensive because it's not usually covered by insurance, but it can help people with severe dry eye where we've already tried the other treatment options. All right, so after dry eye, let's discuss dermatochalasis. So dermatochalasis is redundant eyelid skin. This can be in the upper eyelid, the lower eyelid, or both, which is what this picture is showing. Risk factors for developing this additional eyelid skin include advancing age, family history of dermatochalasis, and smoking. Many of my patients who come to me with dermatochalasis tell me that their whole family has had this problem. It can cause a decrease in the peripheral vision it can also cause a tired or aching feeling from trying to hold the eyebrows up in order to see more clearly. This bottom right picture is a picture of a 
Humphrey Visual Field Analyzer, um, which is something that can be used in order to test the peripheral vision to determine kind of the extent of disability caused by the extra eyelid skin. Treatment options for dermatoclasis are basically surgery. Um, and with the surgery, patients do very well. This is an example of a patient who was having those peripheral vision problems and aching due to excess dermatoclasis, which is removed, and here she is healed after surgery. Now, this isn't one of my patients. This is also from the American Academy website. Um, but I tell patients they can expect bruising right after the surgery, and of course, a change in appearance, although many people are happy with that change in appearance. Now, this can make dry eye worse. So if I have a patient with both dry eye and dermatoclasis, then I usually recommend treating the dry eye aggressively. And if that's adequately treated, then we can consider treatment for dermatoclasis. But if it isn't, I don't recommend treating the dermatoclasis because I don't want to worsen the dry eye. There's also a risk of scar, although that's usually well hidden because the natural eye cre eyelid crease is used. There can be some asymmetry, bleeding, and rarely something like vision loss from bleeding behind the eye. And so it's best if patients aren't taking blood thinning medications for eyelid surgery. Now, if we back up to cataract surgery, I am actually okay with people taking their normal blood thinning medications during cataract surgery um, because it's a different type of surgery and the studies have shown that the risk of stopping is maybe more than the risk of having a problem with the cataract surgery. Next up, we'll talk about floaters. And this is another thing that I hear a lot about in my practice. So what are floaters? Well, floaters are cineresis of the vitreous. The vitreous jelly, as I mentioned earlier, is located in the back half of the eye, and it's generally clear in color. So it's behind the lens, but in front of the retina. It's made of collagen. And as we age, the collagen actually shrinks a little bit onto itself. As it does so, it pulls away from the retina in various places where it's attached very strongly. This can cause what's called a posterior vitreous detachment, which is when that vitreous pulls away from where it was attached over the optic nerve and or over the center vision area. And that can cause some floaters. Inflammation and infection are other co potential causes of floaters. In general, we don't see the floater, but we see the shadow that it casts on the retina, causing the floater. You can see in this picture that the vitreous, as it's pulling away from the retina, is actually pulling on the retina. And we'll talk about that more in a minute, what that means. But risk factors for developing floaters include increasing age, being nearsighted, having trauma, or having surgery to the eye. Flashes of light are even more concerning to me than floaters. Flashes are caused by stimulation of the retina. So if you've ever rubbed your eye and noticed white lights while rubbing your eye, that's caused by the external pressure that you're um, using to stimulate the retina. And that's actually why children who are blind will frequently rub their eyes excessively because they're enjoying that visual stimulation that they otherwise don't have. Um, but it can also be caused by vitreous traction, which is what I showed on the last slide here on the retina. That can be a sign of a retinal tear or even a retinal detachment. Those things can occur if the vitreous does not as it's pulling away from the retina, actually detach from the retina, and instead it pulls a tear in the retina, which could allow fluid to get behind the retina and lead to a retinal detachment. Now, other things that sometimes present with flashes of light would be something like a seizure or a migraine aura. Now, this picture here demonstrates what a migraine aura might look like, and it starts in the upper left hand and then moves to the right, 
and then bottom left and bottom right. So we're seeing as um, a geometric form with some colors um, in the middle of the visual field that expands and then kind of expands more, makes things blurry, and then dissipates. And so that should last 30 minutes or less and is frequently followed by a migraine headache. It's important to note that this visual field defect would actually occur in both eyes. Many times it will seem like it's occurring in only one eye when a patient has a migraine aura. And so I recommend um, that if you don't have a migraine aura right now, and hopefully none of you do, you'd close one eye at a time and see how much you can see with each eye. Because you notice that if you're looking through just your right eye, you can see a pretty good distance over into your left. And so your eyes actually have a good overlap area. And so usually when I have people do that, then they can, oh, okay, I guess it was in an area that's covered by both eyes. And so this should be a binocular process because it's from the brain, not from the eye. Now it's important to note that this should last 30 minutes or less. And so in patients who are having a new visual field defect in both eyes, it's lasting longer, it could be a sign of a stroke. And so I always recommend evaluation for that type of thing on the emergent scale. Now with floaters or flashes, the patient needs a dilated retinal exam to rule out some of these bad things that we've been discussing, like retinal tears, retinal detachments. And so I recommend that if you have many new floaters, white or yellow flashes in just one eye, or a curtain, a shadow, or a bubble in the vision, those all be evaluated emergently. All right, so in summary, a dilated retinal exam is necessary for these symptoms, and so I always recommend bringing a driver. Um, if the patient just has a posterior vitreous detachment or a migraine, the treatment would be monitoring. But if there's a retinal tear, the treatment would be um, a laser treatment to that retina surrounding the tear. And for larger tears or retinal detachments, the patient would be referred for retinal surgery. So that's floaters. Next, we'll discuss glaucoma. Now, glaucoma is the most common cause of optic nerve damage, and it causes slow peripheral vision loss. It's asymptomatic, meaning patients usually don't know that they have glaucoma until they've lost a significant amount of vision or until it was diagnosed with an eye exam. This affects about 2.7 million people in the United States as of 2011, and so we expect that number to be even higher now. This is a picture of testing eye pressure in a patient who may have glaucoma. Risk factors for glaucoma include increasing age, a family history that's positive for glaucoma, a history of having trauma to an eye even many years ago, an elevated eye pressure, use of steroids, especially topical eye drop steroids, having an anatomic narrow angle, or having optic nerves that are asymmetric. Now what I mean by a narrow angle, I'm going to show over here in this picture. And so this picture shows the cornea here and the iris, the colored part of the eye here, and the area in which they meet is that angle that we're talking about. This line here, this labeled three, is part of the ciliary body. Beyond that is the scleral spur and then the trabecular meshwork. So this angle is wide open. We can see all of these structures and then we can see um, where the cornea, the light reflex begins. And so this is a wide open angle. Some people are genetically predisposed to not having very much room in this angle. And their iris can actually move and cover the trabecular meshwork. And that's important because the trabecular meshwork is like the drainage system for the front half of the eye. And so fluid is produced that circulates in the front half of the eye called aqueous humor. It's produced in the ciliary body, which is in this bottom part of the picture. That flows between the iris and the lens, 
and then flows through the pupil to circulate in the front part of the eye and then eventually drains to the trabecular meshwork. If the trabecular meshwork is blocked, that can cause an increase in eye pressure and it can actually cause an angle closure glaucoma. The way that we view this angle is through something called gonioscopy. And so if a patient is suspected to have glaucoma, they'll undergo additional tests. That includes something like a visual field test, which is what's demonstrated on the right-hand side or the results here of a visual field test in someone who has severe glaucoma. I describe this test as a boring video game to my patients, where they look straight ahead and every time they see a flash of light, press a button to let us know kind of what they can see and also how bright a light needs to be to be seen. And then this is compared to the general population as well. The picture on the left here is ocular coherence tomography. And I like this test because it is objective instead of subjective. And so this uses light to bounce off the back of the eye and then recreate the image depending on how long it takes for the light to return to the computer source. And then it uses this information and compares it to the general population to determine if there are any areas of the retinal nerve fiber layer that are abnormal or thin. And then it color codes this information. So it's easy to go through it in clinic with patients and show them the areas that look to be at risk. These two tests can be used to track any changes over time, either in the diagnosis or in the treatment of glaucoma. Now I mentioned that eye pressure is a risk for developing glaucoma. And it's actually the only risk factor that we can control because we can't control our genetics. Um, and so that is what the focus of glaucoma treatment is, is decreasing eye pressure to an acceptable range for a patient. Now what that acceptable range is will vary from one patient to the next because someone who doesn't have glaucoma does well on these tests but has a high eye pressure may be able to be watched without additional treatment for the eye pressure, but someone with advanced glaucoma may have a, what's considered a normal range eye pressure and may actually require the eye pressure to be lowered beyond what would be a normal eye pressure range to mitigate any further damage. So I mentioned treatment. Treatment to lower the eye pressure consists of medications. They're both eye drop versions of medications as well as some pills. And in general, these work by decreasing the rate of formation of the aqueous humor. There are also several types of laser surgery depending on the type of glaucoma a patient has. And that's what this picture demonstrates. You can see this little hole in the iris over here was made by a laser. And the reason for this was because this patient was at risk for angle closure glaucoma based on an anatomic narrow angle, which is what I discussed a couple of slides ago. In patients with a narrow angle, if there's a cataract present, removing the cataract can also be considered as treatment to reduce that risk of angle closure. There are also specific types of glaucoma surgery that can be performed in addition to the different types of laser surgeries and medications. And finally, age-related macular degeneration. So age-related macular degeneration is one of the most common causes of blindness in the United States and is the most common after age 60. In fact, it's present in 10% of people in their 60s, and that number continues to increase as we age. And it's present in up to 30% of people in their 80s. This may be asymptomatic, and this is one of the reasons that I recommend that people after the age of about 65 have an eye exam every one to two years, even if they're not noticing any vision changes. Because this is the type of disease that if caught early, similar to glaucoma, may be treatable. But if it's not caught until late, it can be devastating. This is a picture of someone who has severe dry macular degeneration. And this color photo shows little um, yellow spots here. And those are called drusen. 
Jews are pathognomonic for macular degeneration. And they, are, they consist of lipid and cholesterol. And it's thought that the biochemical reactions that occur during the process of generating vision um, just aren't recycled adequately. The rest of this picture is relatively normal. It shows the arteries and veins emanating from the optic nerve here. This is that OCT, or ocular coherence tomography, in a different view. And so you remember that I discussed how this machine can be helpful in diagnosing and treating glaucoma. Well, it can also be helpful in diagnosing and treating macular degeneration. This bright colored line at the bottom here is part of the photoreceptors. And we can see that it gets uh, quite bumpy, and that is due to drusen. The top part is relatively normal, and this dip here is actually the center vision area called the fovea. This is just another way that we can look at the damage done by dry macular degeneration. This is called an Amsler grid, and normal is on the left side of the screen. This can be used to monitor for changes in macular degeneration in the comfort of one's own home. These are available at our clinic and elsewhere, and we have patients hold them um, about 14 inches away in a normal reading position and wear reading glasses and look at the little dot in the center of the grid. I have the patient cover one eye at a time so that we're testing each eye individually. And the goal is to make sure that everything still looks straight, nothing is missing or distorted. Now, an example of what I mean by missing or distorted is this picture on the right. Um, and this is what someone might experience who has macular degeneration or who has a change in their macular degeneration that's been previously diagnosed. So if one sees this after normally seeing the normal grid, that would be a reason to be seen urgently by an ophthalmologist. So treatments for dry macular degeneration. Unfortunately, there is not a treatment to reverse drusen. There is a treatment available to reduce the risk of progression to more severe macular degeneration, or what is called wet macular degeneration, which we'll discuss next. That treatment is a multivitamin, and that's been studied in a study called the ARIDS-2 study. It includes these amounts of vitamin C, vitamin E, lutein, zeaxanthin, zinc, and copper. Now, this is helpful in people who already have an intermediate stage of dry macular degeneration or severe macular degeneration in the dry form or in the wet form. It's actually not helpful for people who have not been diagnosed with macular degeneration to take the vitamins, nor in people who have very mild dry macular degeneration. It wasn't shown to be of any benefit. Now, because these vitamins are mostly urine soluble. I tell people that that is kind of expensive urine to take the vitamins without the diagnosis. So another reason to see your ophthalmologist. Now what can reduce the risk is having a healthy diet with plenty of leafy greens and fish. Um, and that goes for anyone, whether or not they have macular degeneration diagnosed. I tell my patients that stopping smoking is the number one thing they can do for their health, which probably makes me sound like a broken record. But for eyes, it actually is, because that increases the risk of what we call wet macular degeneration, which is a thief of sight. Now, 10 to 15% of people with macular degeneration will develop wet macular degeneration, which is characterized by abnormal blood vessels that leak fluid into the retina causing distortion of vision and damage to the photoreceptor cells that are necessary for vision. Risk factors for this include family history and advancing age, smoking, high blood pressure, a poor diet, and being overweight. People who develop wet macular degeneration who do not receive treatment, about two-thirds of them will become blind within two years. We know this because there was not treatment available until the last couple of decades. And so many of us probably have family members who were blinded by macular degeneration not that long ago. These are the things that we see with wet macular degeneration. 
You can see this picture, the Keller Fundus photo here, shows mini drusen, which is what this white arrow is showing. And then it also shows areas of bleeding within the retina, which is what the black areas are showing. This can be seen on the picture below in cross-section on this ocular coherence tomography as the cystoid spaces within the retina and beneath the retina. These are some other examples here. And inferiorly, this is an example of fluorescein angiography, which is another test that can be used to determine whether blood vessels are actively leaking. It involves putting an IV into the arm and taking timed photographs of the back of the eye. It's not used as frequently now that we have ocular coherence tomography, which is much faster. But in cases where it's unclear as to the diagnosis, this can be very helpful. Treatment includes injections of a medication into the eye. The medication is known as anti-VEGF. VEGF is vascular endothelial growth factor. And there are several different medications that have this function. Now, this was first discovered because it's used as chemotherapy for other types of cancer, such as colon cancer. And a patient who was undergoing a Vastin or Bevacizumab um, medicines for treatment of their colon cancer actually had improvement of their macular degeneration. That prompted further study, and we can now give this medication in an extremely small dose in the localized area, which is in the back of the eye, in order to combat macular degeneration. This can lead to the blood vessels no longer leaking, which can actually halt vision loss and sometimes improve vision and reduce further damage to the eye. Risks include pain, redness, dry eye, worsening of a cataract, changes in the eye pressure, and need for long-term therapy, sometimes using a different type of medication that's within that same class. And unfortunately, these therapies only last between four and 12 weeks on each patient. And so when the diagnosis of wet macular degeneration is made, a long-term relationship is made with the ophthalmologist with frequent treatments and follow-up in order to save vision. It is an exciting area of ongoing research with many new drugs being researched to hopefully hit the market soon and extend the amount of time between treatments for patients. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I practice across the street at McFarland Clinic, Duff Eye Center, um, and now we have time for questions. All right. I'm fighting with Tim for the uh, control of the mouse, so I'll let him have it. Would I talk a little bit about Fuchs dystrophy? Yes, I'd be happy to. Let me go back here and find a part, a slide that has the part of the eye that is affected. So the part of the eye that's affected with Fuchs dystrophy is the cornea. And the cornea is also the part of the eye that's affected by dry eye. So the cornea is right here on the top. Um, and Fuchs dystrophy is caused by a loss of functioning endothelial cells. The cornea is made of five layers. The outermost layer is the epithelium. That's what hurts when it gets scratched. The innermost layer is the endothelium. When there are not enough cells that are working, um, the cells that are working grow to kind of cover where some of the other cells died. And that causes a change in their shape from hexagon, so they can be polymorphic. And then they don't work quite as efficiently as someone who has a full set of working endothelial cells. Now, the job of the endothelial cells is to pump water out of the cornea to keep it compact so that it's easy to see through. If those cells aren't functioning at a normal rate, that can lead to swelling of the cornea, known as corneal edema, which can make the vision more blurred. This can worsen with cataract surgery. And so sometimes, even with treatments such as Miro 128, which is an eye drop that helps pull water out of the cornea, sometimes a corneal transplant is required to treat Fuchs dystrophy. 
this tends to have a strong genetic component. And so if you have someone in your, in your family with Fuchs dystrophy, um, this might be kind of how you know about this. Um, that being said, the corneal transplants have improved tremendously over the last couple of decades. And so it used to be that a full thickness corneal transplant might be required. And now just the endothelium or the endothelium and a little bit of the stroma can be transplanted within the eye through a small incision that only requires about two stitches. It is still transplant material and it still requires treatment with steroid afterwards for healing. In people who have Fuchs dystrophy, we measure the corneal thickness prior to considering cataract surgery because many people will still do well with traditional cataract surgery, but some people may require a corneal transplant at the time of their cataract surgery or if they don't heal well following their cataract surgery. All right, so Duane syndrome. Uh, usually involves difficulties with eye movements, and it has to do with one of the motor nuclei not developing normally, um, and it's congenital. And so it doesn't necessarily have to do with dermatocolysis. I forgot to read that question out loud. Someone was asking about Fuchs dystrophy, and the next question is asking about Duane syndrome and whether it's similar to dermatocolysis. Um, and also, whether a stroke can affect vision. And the answer is a stroke can affect vision. So um, a stroke is damaged to brain cells, and they, depending on where it's located, some of those can affect vision, but not all strokes will universally affect vision. So the area of the brain that processes information to help us see is located in the back, and that's called the occipital lobe. Now, the information travels from the optic nerves to the back of the eye, the back of the brain through multiple pathways. There's a visual pathway that goes through the parietal lobe, and then there's a visual pathway that goes on the bottom through the temporal lobe. The information is crossed. And so as the information travels from the optic nerves back, then it crosses at the optic chiasm, and that's located in the same region as the pituitary. That's important because someone who has a mass in the pituitary um, that pushes on the optic chiasm can have vision loss as well. And so depending on where the vision loss is, which is determined with that visual field testing similar to glaucoma, we can help pinpoint where the problem might be caused by a stroke or something else in the brain. All right, those are two very good questions. Are there other, I guess, eye or vision related questions? If not, um, feel free to get a hold of me or come make an appointment. I'd be happy to talk about eyes. I'll have you speak All right. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Carol. Wow, what a great presentation. Covered a lot of topics, um, answered some good questions. Thank you for taking time out of your day today. Um, I'd like to remind everybody of the upcoming Primetime Alive programs. We have, uh, actually this week, Thursday, Love the Skin You're In, Diabetes and Wound Care. And then next month, we have a program Tuesday, June 8th at 2 p.m. on foot health with one of our physical therapists here at Mary Greeley. And Wednesday, June 16th at 2 p.m., we have the aging brain. Prevention is the best medicine, and that is Dr. Selden Spencer. So thank you again, Dr. Carroll. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and have a great day. Thank you.